Welcome to Online Algebra 2. This is section 5-9, Transforming Polynomial Functions. So our objective for this section is to apply the transformations uh, that we should know from all the other uh, sections to graphs of polynomials. And the graph of the function uh, y equals a uh, f of x minus h plus k is going to have the same uh, transformations as we've looked at in the past, right? So it's a vertical stretch compression by a factor of absolute value of a, horizontal shift of h units, vertical shift of k uh, on whatever the function was before. So whatever the original function was. Uh, so here is a recap of all the different transformations that we can put on a function, right? So if on the outside of the function, we add k, that's going to shift the function up, subtract k, that's going to shift the function down. And most of the functions that we're going to deal with in this chapter are going to be cubes or um, x to the fourth, or there, there's going to be some sort of exponent here. So really, you can tell really easily whether we're going to have up and down or left and right, because you're going to have some sort of parentheses and an exponent on the outside. So if that number's outside the parentheses, uh, up, down. If it's inside the parentheses, remember this is right. Uh, negative shifts the function to the right. A positive shifts the function to the left. If the number in the front is bigger than one, it is a stretch. If it is between zero and one, it's a, it's a compression. And a negative in the front reflects in the x-axis. A negative inside the function reflects in the y. Okay. So here is our first question. So we're going to start with this function. y is equal to x to the third power. There we go. Uh, vertical compression by the factor of one half. Well, if I want to compress a function vertically, I have to multiply it by that number, followed by a reflection across the x-axis. Well, if I want to reflect something across the x-axis, I make it negative on the outside of the function. A horizontal translation, three right and two up. So now I need to put this into my parentheses, all right? And then the number inside the parentheses is going to be left or right. So if I want to shift it three units to the right, I subtract and two up. And so there is my function that does all of these things compared to the parent function, y is equal to x to the third. Let's try another. So again, we're going to transform y is equal to x to the third. Stretch by a factor of 2. Uh, horizontal translations of 3 to the left. Uh, and we're cubing it because that was our parent function. And then 4 down. And there are my two functions. Okay. So let's take a look at what these graphs actually look like. So the graph of y is equal to x to the third is the black one, right? The original function is right there. And then you could see all the different steps, what effect this had on the function. The one half compressed it and moved it more towards the x-axis. Not a lot, but it, it made these, it made the graph go up and go down more slowly. The negative in the front flipped it over, right? So if it's a negative, it becomes positive. If it's a positive, it became negative. And then the shifts move the middle of the function, right? Right three and right three and up two. So in general, my new function, y is equal to a times x minus h to the third plus k, represents all of the cubic functions that you can obtain by stretching, compression, reflecting, and translating the cubic parent function. So if you have an equation in this form, you could have started it here and moved it uh, any which way 
and to get your new answer. Okay, and, and look at these graphs really quickly. So when we look at my parent cubic function, it only crosses the x-axis once. And all of these, the red one, the blue one, the green one, they only cross the x-axis once, even though it's x to the third power, even though we know that it has three solutions, maybe two of them are going to be imaginary. So let's test this. And if you have A, H, and K, and they're all real numbers, how many distinct zeros does this equation have? Well, let's solve for X. Okay, let's do the general form and solve for X. Let's set it equal to zero. And let's get the general equation. Then we'll try this with numbers in a second. So if I want to let, isolate the variable X, the first thing I have to do is subtract K from both sides. Next, I would divide out a negative A. So now I have K over A is equal to X minus H to the third. Then, in order to isolate the variable, I would take the third root of both sides. So now I have uh, K over A, third root of that is equal to X minus H. And now just add H to both sides to give me that X is equal to the third root of oh, the third root of k over a and h on the outside. Okay, this is one answer. So this will have one solution, no matter what these numbers happen to be. Okay, I will only get one solution, and you can see this when we have actual numbers. So if I'm going to solve this, I could have just used that formula that I just got, but let's walk through this again so we can see what we're doing here, right? My first step is to divide out, or to subtract the 6, then to divide out the 3, and we get negative 2 is equal to x minus 1 to the third power, taking the cube root of that, well, the cube root of a negative 2, uh, unfortunately, negative or 2, you can't take the cube root of 2, it turns into a decimal, but I can take the negative outside. And we'll look at more of that in chapter 6. Okay, and then we just, well, I didn't need those parentheses. And then we just add 1 to both sides. So my answer here for x is going to be negative third root of 2 plus 1. Okay. And you're going to need a calculator to get that exact answer. So uh, problem 1 and 2, the problems we just did, illustrate that the graph of an offspring function of the parent function has only one x-intercept. But the graph of this cubic function right here has three. Right there, you can see it, right? You cannot obtain this function or others like it by transforming the cubic parent function using stretches or uh, reflections or translations, which means that the function, in order to be a, uh, in order to be an offspring of this parent function, must be in this form. Okay. As soon as you have something like this ax to the third plus bx squared plus cx plus d. As soon as you have it in general form like this, it's not going to be related to this function, unless b, c, and d are zero, uh, but then that would just be ax to the third power. Okay. Uh, and then same thing with quartic functions, right? It must be in this form in order to be a parent of the Sorry, in order for this to be the parent, in order for uh, that function to be an offspring. Not to say that you can't graph this function, because we've done that before. Okay? We could very easily find it by uh, finding the roots. It looks like it didn't factor with grouping. So we would guess the possible rational roots. We know them all right here. We have them. Uh, but we would guess the possible rational roots. We would divide out one uh, term using synthetic division. We would use uh, quadratic techniques to get the other. 
uh, roots, and we would get all these three answers, and then we would just plug in our points in order to graph this, estimating the graph uh, for the top and the bottom here because we're not ready to find those yet. Okay, so <clears throat> if I know that a function has only two real zeros, right, but I want to make a quartic function with two real zeros, well, I need to put in two imaginary zeros. So let's use algebraic methods to figure out what a quartic function could look like um, with two real zeros. Okay, so uh, here's my function. We have five and nine as my two real zeros, but I want it to have four answers. So that means I should put in some imaginary zeros. Notice that the imaginary zeros have to come in pairs. They have to come in a conjugate pair. And I pick the two easiest ones. Don't pick a harder one, pick an easy one. Okay? Because now we're going to have to multiply all these together. So that's x squared uh, minus 14x plus 45 times x squared plus 1. When I distribute these two together. Then I... Boil it out, or distribute everything together. X to the fourth with this one, plus X squared, minus 14X to the third, minus 14X, plus 45X squared, plus 45. Combine all the like terms, and no other X to the thirds. Uh, x squared turns into 46. Uh, x and no other x's. And 45. x to the fourth, I did that again. So this is a quartic function with two real zeros and two imaginary zeros. So only two real zeros. Okay. Let's try one more of those. Um, so f of x has two real zeros, zero, and positive six, and then my other two come from x plus i, x minus i. This one's a little bit easier because we got x squared minus six x, and now I just have to multiply two binomials together to give me x to the fourth plus x squared minus six x to the third minus 6x, and all I have to do is rearrange it. And there's no constant term, uh, which is what gives me x is equal to 0, because if I plug in 0 here, I would get 0. And I could factor out an x out of every single term. Does the quartic function negative f of x have the same zeros? Uh, it would because the reflection still passes through the x-axis at the same place. Okay, so the offspring of the parent function x to the fourth is a subfamily of all quartic functions. Again, they look like that, okay? If the function does not look like that, if it looks something like this, it is not a transformation of the parent quartic function. So one other function that we could look at is called the power function. The power function is the form of a times b to some power. Doesn't matter what power, right? So we have 
any number times x to any power. These are not polynomials, right? Because they don't have positive uh, whole number exponents. Okay, that doesn't mean they're not this new type of function called a power function. So if the exponent in exponent b in y is equal to a times x to the b power is positive, the function is also a monomial function. It's a positive integer, right? It's a monomial. So these are these are polynomials. These two are not because they are not integers. If y is equal to axb to the b power, describes y as a power function of x, then y varies directly or is proportional to the b power of x. It's weird to say it like that. But this is a direct variation, right? A constant times some other term, right? y is equal to k times x. In this case, it varies directly with x to the b power. Uh, and then this a right here is still called the constant of proportionality uh, instead of the co instead of the uh, constant of uh, variation. So pair of functions arrive arise in many real world contexts and are very very similar to the things that we did with direct variation. Let's try one word problem that that uses this and we can see how it works. So. Wind farms are a source of renewable energy found around the world. The power P in kilowatts is generated by a wind turbine varies directly. Power varies directly, so some constant times as the cube of the wind speed. All right. Picture shows the power output. And what, okay, so we're going to solve this the same way. We need a data point in order to solve for my constant. And then once I have a constant, I can find any other data point. Okay. So the picture shows the power output. So here's wind. Here's power. So 600 is equal to, and these units all match up. So we don't have to go crazy uh, canceling uh, all sorts of units. A times A to the third. Um, A to the third is 512. So 600 is equal to 512 times some number. And when we divide, we get that A is 1.1719. 1 so to the nearest kilowatt, how much power does the turbine generate in 10 meters per second of wind? So now we're looking for, I have my constant. I want to know what happens at 10 meters per second. Okay. And this problem is pretty easy to solve because 10 to the third power is 1,000. So 1,000 times this number gives me a power of 1171.9. One, okay? And that would be kilowatts. Yeah. Kilo, capital W, watts. Okay? So very, very similar to our direct variation from uh, the beginning of this course. So let's do one little practice with graphing cubic transformations, okay? So we'll first make the parent cubic functions, and then I'm gonna use my technique of using the same pattern to draw the rest of, uh, to draw a different uh, cubic function. So let's plug in zero. To that, we get zero. One, we get one. Two, we get eight. And three would be off the graph. Three times three times three is 27. Okay, so we get one there, two, eight. Now, watch what happens with negative one. Negative one times negative one times negative one is also negative one. Negative two times negative two times negative two is a negative eight. So these answers are the same. The only difference is is that if you get a negative, you get a negative. So basically, my graph is not symmetric like this, like a parabola, 
but it is symmetric with respect to five, six, seven, eight. It's respect. It's, it's symmetric with respect to the origin. That means that this point has its complete opposite point. So this is point one one. We have negative one negative one. This is point two eight. We have negative two negative eight. Okay, and this is what's known as a odd function. These are harder to draw. Something like that. Okay, so. What we can use is we can use this pattern that we have. My parent function goes 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 8, 2 to the third, 3, 27, 3 to the third, right? We use these cubes as my outputs, and then my opposite side, the, the negative side, is always just going to be a uh, reflection, an opposite of that. So if we can start here in the middle, we can graph this very similar to the way I graphed a parabola. So let's do it. Let's do this graph without making a table. So first you need the starting point, the transition point, that the inflection point, the place where the graph flattens and keeps going, the middle of the function. And this has been moved one to the left and two up. So there's my starting point. Now, this function has also been stretched by a factor of 2. That means from the starting point, instead of going right 1 up 1, my output gets doubled. Instead of going right 2 up 8, I would go right 2 up 16, which unfortunately is not on this graph. This one would turn here, and I might be able to squeeze. No, 16 would still be off the bottom of the graph there. And if you're really not sure about this, again, we can plug in 1. And we should get a number that is a little bit higher than my graph. 2 times 1 plus 1 to the third power plus 2. 1 plus 1 is 2. To the third power is 8. 16, 18. So f of 1 is 18. And yes, it was indeed off the graph. So this graph, not a lot going on here. We get something like that. Let's try one more with a fraction, which is a compression. Start at the middle. So this is right two, down three. Now instead of going right one up, right, my now have been compressed by a factor of one half. My parent function goes right one up one. This will go half of that. My parent function goes right to up 8 to the third power. This goes right to up 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. My parent function goes right 3 up 27. This one would go half of that, which is 13 and a half. And I think I have that room for that. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and a half. Okay. Now, all those points aren't going to fit at the bottom. This one goes the opposite. Instead of right one up a half, left one down half. From right, we're taking everything from the inflection point, from the middle. And we go left two, down one, two, three, four. And I'm never going to fit 13 and a half uh, down. So now we get our, our graph that looks kind of like that. Again, if this method does not appeal to you, the other way to graph this is to make a table. And of course, plugging it into a graphing calculator and getting an accurate graph as opposed to, you know, my improvised graph right here would be a good idea as well. So that was 5-9 polynomials and transformations.